Now, the sermon I'm going to be preaching today, it's actually going to be preached in two parts because there's, there's too much content to get to in one service. And I really encourage you all, even if you don't normally do this, uh, to please stick around. We, we've got food provided for you. We're going to be able to, you know, to eat after service. But try to stick around if you can for the evening service as well because both sermons are very important. And actually, the evening service is going to get into some very important doctrine that I really want to make sure we cover. But what I'm going to be teaching on and preaching on this morning and this evening is, of course, this is my, my Christmas sermon. And I think it's very important that we can just take a step back and recognize and reflect on and give honor and glory unto our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the whole point of, of taking a day aside to celebrate the birth of Christ, to celebrate the fact that he came into this world. And the aspect that I'm going to be preaching on when it comes to Jesus Christ is uh, the title of my sermon is The Most Expensive Gift Ever Given. The Most Expensive Gift Ever Given. You know, we go out soul winning, we preach the gospel to people. Anyone that's saved knows that salvation is just a free gift. It's something that you receive for free. You didn't have to work for it. You don't pay for it. You don't earn it. You receive it for free. And sometimes receiving a gift can get lost on the person receiving it of how much actually went into getting that gift ready for you, getting that gift paid for, everything that needed to be done for that gift just to be, all you have to do is receive it for free. Just take it. Just accept it. That's easy. But everything that went into that gift, there's a lot that went into it. And we need to take a step back and, and give recognition and honor unto the gift giver and, and everything that went into it to, to get our hearts right, to get our minds right. It's easy this time of year to get distracted with commercialism. With, with other things that just don't matter, with spending money, with all this other stuff. Let's not forget the whole point and the whole reason. And, you know, honestly, one of the reasons why we even give gifts, see, the, the, <coughs> the, the um, producers of goods out there, they love it when people go out and buy gifts, right, because you're buying their stuff. Uh, but let's not get to the point to where Christmas becomes more about buying stuff than it does about what, what are we even celebrating. And see, the reason why we give gifts is, I believe it's in honor. Well, the reason why we give gifts is because we love people. We want to do something nice for them, but it's not, it shouldn't ever be out of obligation. It should never be out of obligation. You're not obligated. You know, and, and this is where we get to, right? Do, do you have traditions? And then we, it turns into, oh, well, I have, to, I have to buy a gift for this person, this person, this person. I hope, I hope people, at least when it comes to me, realize don't, no one ever has to buy me a gift. Now, I know you guys are thinking like, I didn't think I had to anyways, <laughs> which is good because you shouldn't be thinking that. Usually it's people within family and stuff like that, right? You're always thinking like, well, I have to get a present for this person, that person. You don't have to. You should, the only time you should ever give a gift is because you want to, because then it's going to actually mean something. You're not just checking off a box. If you actually care about someone, you love them, you're an offering. We don't want to cheapen the gift. And we definitely don't want to cheapen the gift that God gave for us. Now, we get accused of that. There's a, there's a phrase out there people will, will accuse us of believing in cheap grace. Has anyone ever heard that before? And the reason why they call it cheap grace is because they don't like the fact that we believe what the Bible says, that it's not of works, that you actually receive it for free. And no, if you go off and, and, and go into sin and willfully sin, you still don't lose that free gift. It still actually belongs to you because you didn't earn it to begin with. You don't have to keep it by doing good. It's given to you for free because God loves you. And the only thing you have to do to accept that gift is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. Amen. That's what the Bible says. It's not cheap. It's free. There's a difference. Cheap means it's very, very inexpensive. Cheap means, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I paid a dollar for this Bible, whatever. That's cheap, right? Because it's very inexpensive. Well, the, the, the gift that we received when we got saved is not inexpensive. It's not cheap. It's actually very, it's so expensive, nobody can pay for it. 
That's why we could, the only way we can receive it is as a free gift. Because no matter how much work you do, no matter how good you are, no matter how well you think you keep God's commandments, it still does not cover the price that Jesus Christ paid for your salvation. We're going to go into detail about all the different things that Jesus Christ did and give recognition where it's due and just help ourselves be reminded of everything that went into your salvation. And also demonstrate how much God loves you. Let's not forget that as we celebrate the birth of Christ in the next couple days here. And look down here. We started off in 1 Peter chapter 2. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. This is talking about Jesus Christ. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the chosen one, elect. And then look at the word precious. Precious means like pricey, right? It's, it, it, if something's precious in your eyes, it's valuable. It's of high value. It's a very price, price, priceless, right? It's precious is where that word comes from. And he that believeth on him shall not be condemned. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the bitter is disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So he's saying, for, unto you that believe, he is precious. That is of high value. It's of extreme value to us. But unto those that be disobedient, those that, that are not believers, disobedient, it's, it's, a, it's a stumbling. You know, it's, a, it's an irritation, right? They stumble at that stumbling block. It's, it's not, it's, he's not the head of the corner or the foundation of everything that we build upon. He's someone that, that people who don't believe, they trip over it. It's an annoyance. It's an irritation. It's something they don't want to have to deal with. But for us, it's the most important thing. It's precious. Of course, the Bible says in, in Romans 6, stay here in 1 Peter chapter 2, Romans 6, 23, and Ephesians chapter 2 talk about how salvation is a free gift. The Bible says... Um, For the wages of sin is death. I don't know why my, <laughs> like one of the easiest verses you say probably more often than any other verse like ever is, uh, you know, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift. And this is one of the reasons why we like to celebrate Christmas by giving gifts because we received a free gift when we're saved. We're celebrating Jesus Christ. We give gifts uh, to show that fact. And of course, in Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. God has a gift for us. And again, it's not cheap, it's very expensive, however, it's 100% free. Uh, John 3.16, of course, the most famous passage in the entire Bible, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this is the first point that I want to make about the expense of this gift. It's for God so loved the world that he gave. So this is his gift. This is what he's giving. He gave his only begotten son. And I like trying to, to point this out oftentimes when I go out and preach the gospel to people. What's the gospel? The gospel is the good news. The good news that there's hope. The good news that you could be saved and go to heaven. And point out to people that God actually loves them. You know, many people we talk to, they might not feel like God loves them. They might be going through some hard times. They might, they might have never had very much going good or so it seems in their life and, and everything seems to be going wrong. But you know what? It's important to point out God loves you. And I, and I often will demonstrate this, especially if there's someone I talk to that has children, you understand this even more. But anybody can understand the concept. It's not that difficult to understand. And, and I, I like to point out to people how, you know, think about what the Bible says about God giving his only begotten son. Imagine you have one child, one son. You know, you, 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 you're going to love that son. That son's going to mean so much to you. And then to offer up your son as a sacrifice to pay for somebody else. Even just offering up your own child to let them go, that's a big deal. That's a, that's a huge, that's a monumental sacrifice. There's something that, that money can't pay for. 
the love that you have between your own child. There's no amount of, there's no amount of money that anyone can give me to take any of my children from me. No amount. They're priceless. They're precious in my sight. And any good parent, that's going to be the case. You're going to love your child to the point to where, look, I don't care what you're going to try to give me. That's my child. I love them and, and I don't want to give them up. But the fact that God was willing to give his only begotten son as a sacrifice in order to save someone else. Now, that's a noble thing. We might think that, well, I might be willing to sacrifice myself for someone else. And that's a good, you know, there are people that do that. There's people that put their lives on the line and, and will, will sacrifice themselves to pay for something else. It's another thing to sacrifice your child for someone else. Now, maybe there are still people that would do that. But we need to put this in the, in the understanding and the context that you know, the Bible says, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the reason why that's so important is that here we are, we're people that we don't deserve anyone to be dying for us. We don't deserve that much good to be done unto us because we're sinners. Because we have a God who said, don't do this, don't do that. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. And we're not, we're going to do any of those things. Definitely not before you're, you're saved. You're not, you're not doing what's right. Yeah. Yeah. You may keep some of the commandments, but you're, you're overall, you're breaking what God said not to do and you go out and do them. So here's someone that maybe you blaspheme God. Maybe you've, you've done whatever, right? But God still loves you enough to, to sacrifice his own, his only begotten son for you. Like that's a lot of love. Imagine someone, you know, you've got your son and there's someone else in a really bad condition and the only way you could save them by sacrificing your son, but this person, they've talked bad about you. Maybe they've stolen from you. They've, you know, they've done all, they've given you all kinds of reasons for you. I don't want to do anything for that person. And you expect me to give my only son for him? No way. I mean, that's how probably everybody would feel today if, if there was an earthly situation. Why? Because our love isn't quite as great as God's love is. But we need to remember the sacrifice that was made. This is one way of demonstrating that sacrifice that was made in order to pay for our sins. It's a big deal. And add on top of that who Jesus was. Hebrews 4.15, the Bible says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but it was in all, po in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Jesus Christ was perfect. He was without sin because he was God in the flesh. He was perfect. Did zero wrong. Did nothing wrong at all, ever. Did not deserve a punishment. Did not deserve mocking and ridiculing and anything else. We're going to get into that also. He was perfect. We're in 1 Peter chapter 2 where we started. Look, jump down to verse number 21. The Bible says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also, excuse me, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. He wasn't deceiving. He wasn't a deceiver. He wasn't tricking people. He didn't sin. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, when people just laid into him and falsely accused him, he didn't go tit for tat and, and start going after them. It says, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed." This is the sacrifice made, the sacrifice of a son who did no wrong. The sacrifice of a son where you can't say, well, he kind of deserved a punishment anyways. No, he didn't at all. Not only did he not sin, he always did those things that were right. So not only did he keep himself from doing wrong, Jesus Christ did everything right. The Bible says in John 8, 28, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. 
He was a son that everything he did pleased the father because he was doing everything he was supposed to do. Not only did the father offer the son, and what a son. What a sacrifice. But the son gave himself willingly. The son decided to lay down his life. Turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse number 17. The Bible says, Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. See, it wasn't, the father wasn't sacrificing the son, and the son didn't want to be sacrificed. Right? He wasn't just binding him up and saying, Nope, you're going to do this. The son was saying, too, he says, You know what? I lay it down to myself. He willingly offered himself. So you have the willing offering of God the Father offering his son as well as the willing offering of the son saying, I'm going to offer myself up for you. I'm going to lay down my life and sacrifice my life to pay for you and your sin. He says, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down to myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This, the, this commandment have I received of my father. Turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, look at verse number 12. The Bible says, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's the amount of love that Jesus Christ has for you. He laid down his life for you. He sacrificed himself. Turn to, to Mark chapter 14. There's a lot of giving involved with our salvation. God giving, God the Father giving His Son, the Son giving His life. Acts 20.35 says, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. We live in a world where many people just want to think like, oh man, I scored this year. I got all this stuff, right? And, and they're focused on the stuff. You know what? You get focused on the stuff, you're going to be left empty. It's not about how many gifts you can receive. Yeah, they may be cool. You may have fun with those toys or whatever, whatever it is that you get. But at the end of the day, it's going to be gone. It's going to be empty and you're going to be left with nothing. Um, and I'm not saying it's wicked to receive a gift. But let's understand the whole point. It is more blessed to give than receive. We shouldn't be more focused on receiving. We should be more focused on what we could do to help other people in the giving. That is blessed. That is fulfilling. That is actually a great, if you know, you know it's a great feeling to be able to, to provide gifts for people and to do something nice for someone, especially when, especially when they appreciate it. And we ought to appreciate the gift that God has given to us because, hey, anyone can receive a gift. Anyone can receive the gift. Anyone can get saved by receiving the gift, by putting their faith in Jesus Christ to save their soul. Anyone can do that. But not everybody appreciates what God did for them. And that doesn't make them unsaved. But that's a fact. Not everyone appreciates what God did for them. I'll be the first to admit, I didn't appreciate for many years what God did for me. By the way I lived my life, it was definitely zero appreciation. I was trampling underfoot the Son of God that paid for my sins by going off and sinning more and sinning willfully and living in the world and doing, making all kinds of bad choices, not honoring God, not respecting God, not even, going, not even showing up to church. We ought to have appreciation and, and make the sacrifice that God made Precious in our sight, because it is precious. 
Now, I might have been personally through my actions cheapening what Christ did for me, but it doesn't change what was put into it. It still is a very expensive gift. And we need to make sure that we are treating it as such and don't ever lose sight of the fact of how precious it is to, to help us to stay humble and to help us to stay in good grace with God um, in his sight because <coughs> when we think about it this way, as, as born again children of God, when a father does something just beyond nice for their children, I mean, make such a sacrifice and put so much into it, so much love, so much effort, and then that child has a, let's say, a spoiled brat type of an attitude or just has zero respect, what's that going to do to the father? It's going to make him angry, right? Right? Now, again, we know that once you're born again, you're never going to be cast into the oven. You're never going to be thrown into the lake of fire. God's not going to do that. Just like if, if I were to work real hard and invest all kinds of time and energy and effort and just pour myself into a gift for my children, right? And I just do everything I can, and I'm like, here you go. I love you. I want you kids to have this. I think this is going to be awesome for you. You're going to love this thing. And they just kind of treat it like garbage right? It's going to make me upset. It's going to make me angry. It's going to be kind of hurtful, right? It doesn't mean they're not my kids. It doesn't mean I'm going to stop loving them. But that's, what, that's the way that, you know, it's a similar way we make God feel when, when we just treat what he did for us as just not a big deal. Not that important. Not that precious. Debbie, turn to Mark 14. The gift of Jesus Christ was necessary for us. It was the only way we could receive salvation. Look at verse number 34. The Bible says, And, and said unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. This is when Jesus Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he was about to be crucified on the cross. My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Verse 35. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Jesus knew what was coming. And it's not that he didn't want to save the world. It's not that he didn't want to, to pay for our sins, but... He was trying to see if there's another way of doing it. <laughs> you know, honestly, like, like he was getting close to that point and he wants everything to be done right. And he's saying, it says he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And the, reason, the, the way it would be possible is to still have everything work out, to still be able to, to um, you know, be the savior or whatever, like to do everything still right, to be completely within the will of God, if there's another way of doing it, because let's face it, sometimes there's multiple ways of, of doing right and being in the will of God and fulfilling what God has for you to do. It's, it doesn't always have to be in one exact mold of doing it. You, there's, there's multiple ways of, you know, it, it, a real simple example, right? If we want to be in the will of God and preach the gospel to people, we go out soul winning today, we can choose street A or street B, Right? or street C, or D, or we could go, you know, we can, we can, we have all kinds of options on how we can do things. Or you don't even have to knock on a door. You can go and just find people walking. You know, there's so many things you could do, and you're still in the will of God. You're still doing things right. And Jesus was here going, hey, you know, is there any way that this hour can pass? Not that he didn't want to be the saver. It's just, is there another way of doing this? And the reason why is because he knew what, we, what he had to face. And this is where we really need to pay attention. Turn to Isaiah 53. We're going to see, we're going to get into some more detail about everything that Christ went through and what he was facing when he had to go to the cross. 
The price of your salvation was not cheap. Isaiah 53. And verse number one. The Bible reads, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. This is the prophecy of Jesus Christ. This is talking about you know, what Jesus Christ went through. He was despised. People hated him. The Son of God on this earth, walking around, healing people, preaching the gospel, giving of himself, traveling, having no place to rest his head, giving completely 100% of himself, not going and making money for himself, not trying to make his life more comfortable or easier, going out to others and ministering unto them, healing them, staying up all night in prayer, going out all day preaching. Yet he was still despised. People still hated him. It says he was rejected. It's not fun. It's not a good feeling to be rejected, is it? I think everybody's probably experienced rejection in one form or another. When someone rejects you, especially when you're trying to do something good for that person and they reject you, despise you. He was a man of sorrows. Yeah, it, it, it makes you sad when people reject you. The Bible says he was well acquainted. He was acquainted with grief and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. It's like, oh, there's Jesus. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. So Jesus came and bore and bared, borne our griefs. He carried our sorrow. He came for us. But then what the Bible says here, yet we esteemed him stricken. Like, oh, yeah, God's really plaguing him. God's really coming down on him. Yet he was carrying our sorrows and our burdens. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Think about that. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all, all of our sins. You run down the list of every sin you've ever committed, you probably forgot them. I know I have. I thank God I've forgotten some of them because I don't want to be thinking about those. But if you go back and start scanning your brain for all the things that you've done that you know are wicked and wrong, and you think about every single one of those things was laid upon Jesus Christ. Every one of them. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. They made his grave with the wicked. So yeah, the thieves, the people who had actually done wickedly that he was crucified with, that's how he was treated. That's how he was esteemed like he's just some common thief and not the Son of God, not the Savior of the world. It says, but he had done no violence, and neither was deceit. He didn't lie. He wasn't deceitful. Verse number 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. 
when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Turn to Psalm 22. It's the last place I'll have you turn this morning. But what we see here in Isaiah 53, over and over again, it's saying that he bare our iniquities. I mean, he saw that in probably three or four different verses, multiple ways. He came and bare the iniquities of the world. He came to bear our iniquities, and that's what he was being punished for. And it says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And that's an interesting verse. It pleased the Lord that he was suffered and afflicted because in his suffering and affliction, our sins were being paid for. By Jesus taking on all of the iniquity of the world, In God, punishing, bruising, and, and pouring out his wrath. And we're going to go over that more tonight. On Jesus, needed to be done. It was necessary for our salvation, for us to be saved. And I believe that's where it pleased the Lord because in pouring out all of that punishment on Jesus Christ, it allows the door to be open for us to receive forgiveness of sins. Because the payment that he's making is capable of being applied to everybody because he bare the sins of everybody. That's a big load. That's a big burden to bear the sins of the whole world being put on his shoulders. Psalm 22, we're going to close with Psalm 22. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Here we get an insight to what Jesus was experiencing on the cross. And we'll, we'll, it's proved as we keep reading this. You'll see all of the prophecies that were fulfilled. The New Testament talks about this as well. All of his bones are out of joint. I mean, think about him hanging up on that cross. And just the weight and everything bearing down and having the pain of the nails in his hands, his joints, his, his joints all being out of joint, his bones just, just being pulled. And that stress, my heart is like wax. What do you mean? It's melting. He's losing strength. He's losing everything. His, his heart is just melting within him. Verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. Think about like a clay pot. Like it's just, there's, no, there's no water in there. It's just dry. So my strength is just dried up. He's losing all strength. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. He's so thirsty. I mean, all of these little details, any one of these by themselves is pretty bad. And we've all probably experienced certain things. Of one, you know, maybe you've had a joint out of socket, a joint. Maybe you've had an extremely dry mouth because you weren't able to drink for a while, whatever, and, and your, your tongue kind of swells up and you almost are choking because it's so sticky inside of your mouth that you just can't, you, 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 you can't breathe practically. And you're so thirsty, you give anything just for a drink. Your heart, his heart's melting in him, strength dried up, mouth cleaving to his jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced 
my hands and my feet. Obviously, talking about Jesus Christ on the cross. Verse 17, I may tell all my bones. That word tell means he's able to count them. Like a bank teller counts money. He's I'm able to tell all my bones. How can you tell all your bones? Why? Because he's up there and he could literally see his bones. He's been scourged. The Bible says they look and stare upon me. In other places, it talks about the way that Jesus was whipped and scourged and how he's bleeding. They actually literally cut through his skin and his flesh to where he was able to see his bones. I mean, he was beaten. The Bible says that his visage, his face was marred more than any man. I mean, he was beaten up so bad. It's just like he was a bloody mess. They whipped him. They put the crown of thorns on his head. They smacked him with a reed on top of the head. They put a, they put a, a bag over his head and hit him. And they're like, oh yeah, who, 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 uh, who hit you? Prophesy unto us. Mocking him and ridiculing him, spitting on him. This is the son of God. This is the son of God who did no wrong. He did no wrong to any of these people, to anybody. He only did good. He healed people. He gave his life, the ransom, all of what he did. When it boils down, it was for you. Individually, it was for you. He suffered and endured all of that for you. Verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. And we can go on literally and read, and I recommend you doing this. It's going to be a little bit shorter sermon this morning because there's just too much content for me to go over um, in one sermon. Read through the Gospels. Read through the, 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 what Jesus went through on the cross. A lot of things I just mentioned goes into more detail. The price that was paid for you, that, that gift that was bought for you to, be, to have eternal life, for you to go to heaven, it didn't just stop with all of the physical things that happened when Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross. We're going to get into this more tonight, but when, when he said it is finished on the cross, it wasn't everything that was needed to be done for our salvation was not done on the cross. If that were the case, then what about the resurrection? Jesus needed to rise again from the dead to, to also, as part of the gospel, as so part of the, the payment for our sins, he needed to not only be crucified on the cross, but he also had to rise again from the dead three days later, but he also had to pay for our sins more than just being whipped and nailed to the cross. The Bible says his soul went to hell. And we're going to cover that in detail this evening. And I want to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt in everybody's minds that that is a fact. Amen. And we need to give proper recognition, understanding, not just to everything he did. Look, everything he did in this life is a lot. And that alone ought to be very precious to us and, and ought to, to melt our heart when we think about what he did for us. It's amazing. It's incredible. But it didn't stop there. His soul went to hell for our sins. And I'm going to prove that tonight. And that's why I'm, I'm splitting this up because that alone is kind of a, an entire sermon in and of itself. But I don't want us to lose sight of what Jesus Christ did for us. I don't want to cheapen what he did for us in any way, shape, or form. But because it is so great, because it is so precious, because there is nothing like it. I mean, this is the most expensive gift anyone's ever given. Amen. No amount of works, no amount of time, no amount of effort, no amount of money can pay for what Jesus did for you. 
The blood that he shed, that perfect, innocent blood running through his veins, you cannot pay for that. The love that was given in offering up of himself as a sacrifice and the father sacrificing his only begotten son, you can't buy that love. It can only be given. We just have to receive it. But let's not cheapen it. Let's not cheapen it. If we're going to celebrate a day and call it Christmas and call it, say, we're celebrating the birth of Christ, let's do that then. Let's actually do it. Let's not forget what we're celebrating. Let's not get so wrapped up in things and toys and games that we forget what we're even celebrating. Take time aside with your family, with your friends, if you're by yourself this year, whatever you're doing, whatever your plans are, take time aside and read God's word. Do whatever you want to do. I mean, I family, we, we sit down and we read Luke chapter 2 every single year. It's our tradition, just personally in our house. Do what you want to do, but you know what? Make sure you're giving honor and glory unto Jesus Christ. I mean, if, you're, if you choose not to celebrate the day, that's fine. I don't care if you choose not to celebrate Christmas. No big deal to me. That's not some commandment that you have to celebrate Christmas. I like the holiday. I think it's great. And if you're choosing to take a day aside to celebrate Christmas, then let's celebrate Christmas. Let's celebrate the birth of Christ and give him honor, give him respect, give him glory. And you know what? One of the best things you can do is instead of being worried about what gifts you're going to give, why don't you go give the gift of salvation to someone else? You didn't buy it. You didn't pay for it, but you've received it. Let's show other people that great gift. Let's change their fate forever out of the love that God has for them and show them, hey, you want a, you want a, you want a great gift this year for Christmas? The most expensive gift in the whole world. No one could ever give you a better gift than this and show them how to be saved. Let them understand the love that God actually has for them. Explain that to them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what it's all about, my friends. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much. So much, Lord. Words cannot express how grateful we are for your love and how much you care about us and the sacrifice that was made for our souls. Lord, we thank you. Again, we cannot thank you enough for, for, for loving us and caring about us. God, help us. We, we're weak. We need your strength. We pray that you would please help us to stay focused on spiritual things, on good things, on right things. Help us to, to bring the gospel of peace and the good news to, to others, Lord, and not to be self-absorbent, but to, um, to realize that it truly is more blessed to give than to receive. Let's give of ourselves. Let's give of our time in honor of your gift, of your time and your love and, and yourself to us. I pray that you please help us to maybe start our own traditions of doing something for others that have no way of paying us back, giving gifts to others, giving the gospel to others, that, that people that have nothing, Lord, help us to go out and do for them as you've already done and, um, and, and demonstrate the love of Christ that way, Lord. I pray to you, please just, just help our church to do uh, many works that would be pleasing in your sight, dear God, and that would show our respect and, uh, for everything that you've done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.